Hello, everybody. I'm Stuart Valko. I'm on staff here at University of California, San Diego. I work at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And I also work with the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination and here for the Office of Innovation and Commercialization. And this is the event on XR and immersive storytelling. And we have a panel of very experienced producers and executives from Hollywood that are going to talk about the intersection of immersive and XR and the entertainment industry. We're going to talk about virtual worlds, the Apple Vision Pro announcement, and the implications that virtual AR and XR will have on society, identity, and the future of the entertainment industry. To the XR immersive storytelling reception mixer and panel. And I'm happy to say this is uh, the first time we've been able to get some cooperation from the Producers Guild of America, which I've been a member of for 15 years uh, in San Diego. Hopefully we have more of these. Uh, and the Television Academy of Arts and Sciences. So making a bridge to Hollywood, production community, and the people that are doing immersive and XR for the entertainment industry. I'm Stuart Valko. I am on staff here at UCSD. I work for the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences as a project manager and a science communications producer. I work with Professor Brian Keating, who's the Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics, and he has a podcast called Into the Impossible, which I also produce. And we are proud to be the lead institution for the Simons Observatory Collaboration, which is the largest, most advanced cosmology observation experiment ever done, mm. looking at the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. And the podcast has blown up to the top 1% of podcasts and science and natural uh, subjects. And we also work with the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination, which studies the neuroscience of imagination and mashes up science fiction, science, and sponsors research in space exploration and related things that Arthur C. Clarke's legacy is interested in. Um, so I taught this first course slash seminar series on immersive and XR. This building, part of its mission is to be a collision point for industry and students in the university. And the fourth floor is the Office of Innovation and Commercialization. And we also have a uh, sprouting immersive program that's ramping up here. And it's sponsored by the Office of Innovation and Commercialization, which uh, is instrumental in fostering the startup ecosystem of UCSD. Thanks to my colleague, Greg Horowitz, that helped me put all this together. He's the director of innovation for the university. And he's the person that agitates it, as Atticus, my son, was saying. He's the searcher. So he's going out and finding opportunities for this kind of, these kinds of collaborations for the startup ecosystem in San Diego and UCSD. We had a bunch of speakers I want to acknowledge that we've had throughout the course. So you're going to meet Dominique and uh, uh, Neil a little bit later. They run the visualization labs on campus. Um, and we had Dr. Eric Beery, who goes back to the very beginnings of VR and has done research on headsets and eye tracking and VR sickness uh, with pilots. And now he's doing research using VR as the, as the test environment in neuroscience. He also is a flight surgeon and was the doctor for the zero gravity mission with Stephen Hawking. Mm. So interesting, good to be here. Uh, we have Jason Yim, who's the founder and CEO of Trigger, which is an AR agency, the amongst the overlapping stuff. We'll talk about that. We had Greg Catano, who's also instrumental in the New Media Council, past, I think it was past co president of the New Media Council. And um, with the Producers Guild of America, he just got a new job at the DT uh, in LBE. And I had Krista Kim, who is an artist, digital artist, that works on digital worlds uh, and digital humanism. And this was our speaker series, and now we have all of you. So this is the cave that you're going to see later uh, from above, and that's one of the rooms in the visualization lab and studio. And that's Dr. Smith, who's going to be here in a little while. He's uh, doing a graduation of one of his classes. And I thought I would just kind of point out, a, just really quickly, where we've come from. I kind of was thinking about this today. 
I remember, because I was selling computers out of a computer store a long time ago, and, and one of the last things I sold was an IBM PCXT system for $4,000. And that was like a normal amount of money to spend on a PC. And that was an IBM PCXT with like a 100 megabyte hard drive and you know a megabyte of memory. And that was around the same time that the Mac came out. I remember this commercial. I don't know, you know did, who recognizes that commercial? Oh, yeah. Does everyone know it? Does anyone not know it? Right? Yeah. That was the famous commercial, 1984. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. This is another one of these kind of milestones because if you think <laughs> about the, this is some picture that I just screen grabbed, so it was, was thrown up there, where all these devices that you know we've kind of lived through a lot of these generations. Um, from a Walkman and a boombox and a GPS and a video camera and you know all mashed together into an iPhone and now we've got you know the iPhone strapped to your face whatever you want to call it. So we'll have to, well, we we got to discuss that. A little that's bit, right? a great <laughs> idea. Um, and that brings us to you know, today's right? panel, which I'm going to introduce everybody. I'll make a shot of introducing them. They can fill in more and more of uh, themselves. Yes, Ashley. Okay. Work, work, or something. Um, Is he going to give us notes too? Because I just want to know. <laughs> yeah. No, he's so not shy. You'll give us notes. Great. Okay. Um, at, at first, consist, let me know. I want to introduce uh, Chris Tomes, who is a UCSD alum, and he really helped me put these people together and make this happen. Uh, thank you very much. He is a VP of Creative at Disney TV Studios. I found a video of you and you got a quote that said, a producer, a producer's job is to make choices. And the best thing is to rely on is your experience and things you believe in. I thought that was a really good quote. You can elaborate on that That's a little sound good. I don't joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> 2019, this is... Uh, Are you sure? It's not embarrassing. You. <laughs> it says, yeah. now it's storyteller's universe. So we went through this boom, right, where there's so much content being produced, where really it was a kind of a gold age. Um, he's a multi-Emmy winning creative executive, and he really works to enable creators to visualize and pitch and tell their stories. But he's also a very accomplished producer in his own right, and he's now interested in Web3 creation. Origami. And the potential of communities to produce in a community economy ecosystem. So we'll talk about more, more there. And he came from ABC Studios, and you know, he did ABC original scripted materials and shorts way back when. The digital Oscar experience. I totally remember the digital Oscar experience. When there was a multi-screen where you see the yeah. shorts on your iPad, and you do it on your iPhone, you watch TV, and you get the backstory. It was very complicated. Um, and not to mention, he started out with Saban, which is uh, Power Rangers. Um, is it in the uh, And how, uh, so so that that that's some stories about that with Power Rangers. He used to wear the green suit. And then <laughs> next, uh, Eric Shamlin. So hello, Eric. Eric is the EVP. Mm -hmm. Higher than BB. <laughs> the EVP, Global Head of Entertainment for Media Monks. So Media Monks is a multifaceted creative agency that's really doing a lot of innovating in XR for branding. It's part of a big conglomerate, 9,000 employees all over the world, 150 lions. That's pretty impressive. Um, 45 Web Webbies. 50 offices, that's a lot of people that you're mustering to, to work in this field. So great perspective from that. And you were saying in, in some quote on the website <laughs> that we are in a new era of digital advertising, marketing and technology, and that AI is changing everything you know about marketing. That's like the front and center thing on the website now, right? Which is pretty interesting. So we touch on that a little bit. Eric, you uh, Christina, Christina Lee, director of virtual production at Netflix. So Form we talked life. about virtual production. Form Form formally. Class. What is it? Formally. 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 You changed? Well, it's not your LinkedIn, so that's all I can, that's all I need. What is it? You know what? 
Well, you'll have to. Don't correct. believe in LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> Don't believe in LinkedIn. It's all you. But I did look up your IMDb, and you have 22 producing credits, which is really impressive, and a bunch of awards. So you're like a really experienced producer, and you have a mile of experience in all the technologies of XR, whether it's previs or camera, you know, simulation or virtual green screen. I mean, it's, it's really impressive. And you were a VP at DreamWorks Animation, which is not too shabby. Um, <laughs> and you led the Advanced Creative Technology Group at DreamWorks. And you spearheaded the studio's motion capture and real-time technology initiatives. We talked about motion capture, performance capture. So you've got a lot of experience in visual effects and all the things that go into XR. Next, we have Joe Gill, who's really easy to introduce, because all I get from you when I, when I, when I introduce you is I can't describe what I do, but it's great to be part of such a fantastic team. So it's secret, because you work for Lucas Films, and no one can, can I can't even say that. I shouldn't forget. Cancel that. I work for but, the, 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 the. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, he kind of knows what's going on under the hood of all this stuff. The pipelines, the software stacks, the really nitty gritty details of the VFX world. And I, really, I, I like to emphasize to people that are interested in XR, this is from the VXX, VFX industry. I mean, this is all things that the movie business really pioneered. Um, and finally, also you me introduce is John Canning. So I will not tell you how far back I know John. Um, I won't admit how many years that is. But all I'll say is we have 256 mutual connections on LinkedIn. So that's a critical mass of people that we know in common, because we've crossed paths a lot. He's a, uh, a virtuoso producer. He can do it all. I mean, he can shoot, he can edit, he can you know, do the budget, do the schedules, he can do the creative. Now he's working for AMD, did I got that right? Are you actually full-time with AMD? Yeah. Really? I make chips, man. You have a job? You, have a, you actually have a full-time job? Just, I, I like, he's known me long enough that he goes, do you, you actually like, have a job? He just wanted to be, he likes to be free. <laughs> and it's he, true. he's a really creative guy. <laughs> uh, but he really, uh, he worked for Digital Domain. Uh, I knew him since he worked, what was, where was that bike? You remember from Microsoft? Microsoft. Microsoft, did he work for Yahoo, right? And Yahoo. Yeah, Yahoo. So I, I told her Yahoo had this massive studio complex, and they were doing interactive TV, and you know, John was uh, producing TV shows for Yahoo, when that was supposed to be then, and it's now a little bit later than it was supposed to happen. But yeah. <laughs> One day, content is going to be a thing. I, I remember all the digital Hollywoods we were at. We must have been to 20 digital Hollywoods. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just incredible the, the, the amount of change in the time that I've known you. And what hasn't? So now, <laughs> now, you, now you're in the chip business, which is really weird. But AMD, everyone knows Intel, everyone knows NVIDIA, so AMD definitely needs a little bit of help with their that's what, yeah. you know, industry developer relations, which is kind of what you're doing. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm doing. The silicon powers everything. So I will, I will start, I, I'm just going to keep it to a, like a discussion. You know, we're not going to have any hands raised there. We can discuss it. You can ask questions. We'll keep it loose. There's a microphone there if you have trouble hearing you. And the first thing, you know, I want to talk about, which, we, which is the obligatory Apple Vision Pro discussion. <laughs> so, <laughs> and he can take it in any order, but, but, you know, is it a big deal? Is it a breakthrough? Is it the, you know, the, uh, so some people think it's just the, the worst thing. It's a flop. It's a huge mistake. No one's going to ever wear goggles. Why did Apple do this? Scott Galloway, who I kind of follow, Prop G, says it's Apple's first flop, and Tim Cook has never greenlit it. What do you guys think? All right, you go, well, Eric. You start. Do we need to use the mic or no? Can you hear us? Uh, can yeah, you hear us? You're great. Who's awake in the background? You can put the mic on. What about, like, what put about in the middle the, here? Uh, it'll pick it up. There the, you go. the people on the, the inner uh, yeah. uh, the uh, inter uh, I don't, I mean, I, I, I can't say it's a flop. Um, I think they're smart in how they target it. Uh, the price point, I think they know exactly what they're doing. They're not targeting a consumer. Mm -hmm. They're targeting an enterprise, B2B level user who has the money to spare. I've already been on multiple calls this week uh, trying to figure out how we're gonna use it in multiple projects. So I, it's just a business use case. It's not a consumer use case, which is, which is a deviation for them. Um, you know, all their products are consumer targeted, you know, with the, maybe the Mac Pro kind of an exception. Uh, but this is, a, this is expi explicitly an enterprise device. But and so 
Um, do you all agree with that? Or? Well, no, no, but I, I think in terms of their targeting, their, their price points, yeah. consumers, yeah, yeah. there will be consumers yeah. using it, but in terms of like who they're who their core target is. It's an enterprise. But that, that's what I'm fascinated about it, because yeah. I mean you you know that because you're you know, you're having those business conversations. Yeah. But I looked at like you look at all the marketing and it has like casual like I'm sitting on the couch yeah. wearing one of these talking to people and I'm like none of the positioning yeah. was enterprise focused. It was yeah. all like yeah. very warm, touchy feely Apple. But Yeah. But the, I think the price point signals it, that it's not it just screams that, yeah. right. Yeah. You know, that's what I think is fascinating about it. Yeah. I mean, I ran into an Apple employee, and luckily I found out they were an Apple employee before I really gave my opinion. Um, <laughs> but no, he said, well, what do you think? And I said, we are at a time that we needed somebody like Apple to reinvigorate the business, Yeah. right? Because Meta, you know, when, when Facebook bought Oculus, the good news is they bought Oculus. Bad news is they bought Oculus. <laughs> But they helped inject and move the industry forward. Yeah. HTC, God love them, can't find yeah. with both hands. But but the the XR business was languishing. It was I mean Magic Leap nowhere, HoloLens dead, like HTC. And that's why I would say that app like that with Apple, like literally putting the stake in the ground, is huge. Yeah. Like your question, is, like I think it is huge because they were willing to say, hey, we're gonna go here, we're gonna release this, it's a big reveal for our developers conference, and here's all of the, whether you, you can take it any way you want to, yeah. whether it's a marketing thing or whatnot, yeah. but all of the tech from all the years, it does feed into now we have this. Mm -hmm. It's a version one, it's yeah. early, like you have to remember, it's early days. Let the developers come out, figure out some cool things that they could do, test it out, and it's not, if, if people are saying, oh, well, you know, like, yeah, I don't wanna wear ski goggles on my face outside. Like someone, my friend in New York is like, if I see someone wearing that on the subway, I'm gonna just like hit him. Yeah. But you know, um, I think it's, it is exactly what Canning said. It's like, it's a, it was a, I felt it was like a, you know, like, reinvigorating, inspiring something that someone like Apple can only do really and see let's just let's beta this and see what happens. I'm, I'm interested what version five is gonna look like. Yeah. I, just I'm, like I'm the, the watch. Exact same page. And I'm actually a bit more optimistic. I think we're coming out of the Gartner hype cycle. We're hitting the plateau. Um, the Quest is actually doing relatively well. It's 20 million headsets, active user base. Uh, so I think the market sort of course corrected. Um, you know, in 2017, it crashed hard, yeah. and in 18, 19, dug itself out. I think the Quest, Quest Pro, um, Meta's already signaled two other headsets coming out, so there's a, clearly, you know, a growing user base, and I think Apple's coming in, you know, 900 pound gorilla, and they're saying, this is a thing we're gonna commit to. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe they'll lose their shirt for a few years, but they're Apple, they can do that, right? They have a lot of shirt to lose. Yeah. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, is, it's not out yet, right? Like, this was the, Announcement and you know certain companies in the room that will remain nameless may have been involved with this from early on. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was in the it was in the it was an announcement, yeah, yeah. right? Right. It's, it's, but it's but it with, now that awesome. now you know is the go get people hot and fettered. You know, doing it with Unity I think was super smart. Like I was in fear that they were going to go a development route that was some other direction. You know, which builds on what a lot of XR developers have been working with. Well, it's why like, do you like Unity so much? Just to clarify, it, it's a platform, right? It's a a broadly accepted development platform. It's not go learn a new coding language. Uh, you know, there's a lot of developers already focused on that that are outside the XR business and the XR business. So, you know, it, I can't you can't say it's a flop yet because it's not out. Like it's yeah. it's like it's the precursor of the thing and juice the market. The one thing that I did have a fear of was they did the exact same thing that Magic Leap did. Remember the blue whale video <laughs> that Magic Leap showed everybody? And the expectations yeah. to play Oh my God, and then everybody put the headset on and went, where's the <laughs> blue whale? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, did, yeah. I got a field of view of this. The uh, yeah, I, I have to say that, I mean, take the, looking at it from a different point of view, it'll be interesting for Apple, who by the way is not a computer company, they are a lifestyle brand company. Yeah. They, they, a lot of their technology is not the best technology. It, what they are great at is 
to X. Paradigm shift mm -hmm. in scale. Yeah. They hit the market in, in a way which, like the person sitting on the couch going, I'm amazing when I'm wearing these. <laughs> that's what they want, and that's what they're looking to do is change the consumer that's it. behavior that's it. around this. Now, I think what they have a long way to go on is how does augmented reality help my mom? <laughs> she doesn't give. She's the line, I'm not even going to say. Give a shit. <laughs> we know what you're going to say. She does not care. How do they get her to care? So Disney Plus is not going to get her to care. What is going to get her to care is when she's able to look at video, a video experience of her granddaughter's birthday. That will snap her mind. So how do they get to that point? They know. They've got a plan. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see this roll out, yeah. but it is the consumer uptake of that. And frankly, I'm more interested by the usage of it down the line as creators, as people who are going to yeah. change industry, who are in engineering, who are building worlds. I now use this device when okay, I'm so, working yeah. in, a, in a way I have yeah. never used a tool before. Your, your 4,000 huge IBM computer, you don't carry that with you. you I don't have that. to. It, this does and all And I completely thing. agree with Chris with Chris is that it's there it's it's Apple they have a play on you have to think about what is it that what is the user doing what are we looking at that that the user will become more you know accustomed to that's what's happening just like you know how we're all right. getting that yeah. bone in need, our like, neck if someone's doing dishes <laughs> and wearing it and it's part of like their life that's when you've hit. Yeah, that's I think, when it's I think working. they're doing foundational education. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I think it's, I actually think it's a sort of a baton handoff from social AR. I actually, for the last few years, I've been thinking Snap, yeah. uh, IG, TikTok, using lenses and filters and stuff. They're training an entire generation, two billion users, yeah. on how to use augmented reality without using the words. You know, it's a mm -hmm. lens, it's whimsical, it's, it's almost, don't even think about it. So I think, they, they, I think social AR was doing foundational level training and yeah. education. Uh, societal level, uh, and that Apple will now sort of take that baton and hopefully reach another level. So, yeah, they never used comes. the word metaverse. They never used nope. the word VR, nope. right? Or virtual nope. reality, nope. never once. No, nope. I think that's key. That's key. So, was there anything about it in particular that technically made you go, "Wow, that's a breakthrough," or "That's foundationally different"? I mean, it, it's the sum of all parts. But was there anything about it that you thought was particularly distinguishing? I mean, it was funny. It was sort of like a catch-22 where they, like, you could see the eyes, but then later on you dig a little bit further and it's not your it's eyes. Not your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm very curious of how that actually is going to play out. But, um, you know, I think, um, I don't know if there's any, like, wow, that's a techno technological advancement. I think it's a it's a build upon everything that they've had, like from mm -hmm. the the sound and all of those things. So, um, I think I think where some advancements are going to happen, and this is just like it's been the same for VR forever. It's just like, you know, how long can you have it on? Like people are complaining, it's like two hours, right? And then the other thing well, is, the battery is only two hours. Yeah, battery is two hours. Mm -hmm. And then it's also like, how far can you push it? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and what can you see in that? And so I think those are the things that we've been grappling with forever. And maybe, you know, you guys help solve that. So do you, do you think that, that, if, that, that HMDs in a form factor approximately like that will become a no. mass market? No. No. Okay. I think it, because I, I, I think it still has to push on the, the ergonomic yeah. aspect mm -hmm. of it, right? Like. But my point being is, is in, you know, Meta's going through whatever transitional stage they're going through, but the continual big money, I don't care if I lose money, but I've got to push the research, the material design forward is the thing that has to happen, right? Like, I want my Oakleys to be able to do this. Yeah. They're not there yet. You know, you remember the Bose mm -hmm. uh, yeah. sunglasses, so, yeah. you know, that had, you know, Okay. They, they were awesome. Okay. Yeah, they were awesome, <laughs> yeah. right? Like, if you could then make those that I had to either go fully opaque or see partially through, the, the material science, the ergonomics still had to be pushed forward. But that takes money and research and time, and it takes somewhat compelling 
you know, we're going to put it out, we're going to fail, we're going to learn, we're going to move it forward. So I don't, is that form factor that much better? No, and but. We, and we forget the, the timeline. Like, uh, Palmer Lucky Kickstarter was 2012. Yeah. You know, and they were acquired by, in 2014. So we're less than 10 years from the starter pistol with Facebook, right? right. Yeah. So, and the Quest Pro and the Vision Pro now are light years ahead of what was yeah. less than 10 years ago, right? So right. I think there's a cultural barrier too that has to, it's gonna take time. So, you know, you showed the images of people with the Walkman and they had the headphones on and, and even people back in the 70s when they had the great big headphones, which now are back in style, <laughs> at my gym at least. But that's a thing to, I see people with earbuds and I know not to talk to them, right? Maybe they just have them on noise canceling but I know that they don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural thing that's going to start happening too. The reason you can see the eyes through a, an eyeless faceplate is because they know they have a big problem, yeah. which is that we've already got a culture that's super isolating because of social media and technology. So are you going to solve that problem by making people disappear further into yeah. their closet that's right. and just say goodbye to the world? So mm -hmm. I think that they're saying, we're going to put a stake in the ground and we have a lot of work to do to bring people together in a way that they've never brought people together before. Because Apple is all about people together. That is their brand. It is about look at me. Mm -hmm. It is not about I'm going to go hide. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that they're not quite there yet and their brand marketing hasn't really hit. I think they used it as a, an A-B test to put it out yeah. and go, okay, note to self, yeah. don't right. do that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Can I guess who would like to ask a question? Uh, what do you think? So when you said that um, the uh, uh, the grand your grandparents are going to say the grandparents, I'm pretty sure in the talk they said that there's going to be a feature where you can see your kids' video in all around screen with mm -hmm. panorama. Same so with what do you think about the prices for the Apple headphones or, or and VR because the <laughs> headphones are like five hundred dollars and the your headset is three thousand five hundred dollars, obviously, which is I think pretty um, overpriced for like the new Oculus, which should be back in So, what do you think about that? I think I, I think somebody's yeah. bucking for something for Christmas, but Vision Pro versus Oculus, three hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. But I think that's what Eric is leaning into, yeah. and, and you know, again, being a media monks, being in a large agency, talking to brands and things like that, I think. Yeah, that price point puts it in the Varjo high-end headset design simulation marketplace. It's 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 a bit of a disconnect, but again, that's a price they announced in the market. Is that the price that's going to sell when it? Oh, I, uh, yeah, and I, and I think brands and the B two B enterprise user, I think, is the primary. But I think also, I want to make sure if I like what Chris said. I think it's also creator targeted. There's yeah. a lot of uh, like right. creators will. All, I would consider them a business market. They're not a consumer. Market. Yeah. Um, and so I think the creator economy, which is really smart, because they're aware of yeah. like TikTok, they're aware of whatever the media trends are right now. So getting it in, in the hands of creators will be key as well. Yeah. Yeah. I was impressed that it can do 3D binocular video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recording. Yeah. Right. Because I remember the Nokia. What was the Nokia 360 stereo camera? Was fifty thousand dollars, and that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. But these cameras were very expensive. Moving on from the HMGs, uh, I think we've spent enough time on that. We'll see what happens. I wanted to know from each of you, you've got a lot going on. What are some of the projects that you're working on now that you're excited about? What's one particular example of a project? You've got a good cross-section. Anybody can start. Um, maybe we can start with Christina, because you're involved in production technology. Is there? <laughs> OK. Is it uh, no, no. Um... Because I'm, really I'm at a reset, so there's not a specific project that I would say, but I, what I am excited about is that I am in a position now where I can kind of see the entire landscape of everything that is currently coming to fold, from Vision Pro to disruption to different workflow tools that AI is like helping there's a lot going on, and what I'm excited about is I'm not at one particular place to just like try and figure that out, but that I can see the landscape and kind of connect the dots and figure out, okay, where are we going? What's happening? 
like now to like two years. And then for me, I get excited about like three to five and then beyond. But the, for, I have the realism part of my brain, the producer brain, is I want to see that kind of made, like I want to see it applied, executed, mm -hmm. and then out to, out to market, I guess you could say. But no specific project. Does anybody else have any projects they can discuss? And Specifically leveraging HMDs? Um, Not HMDs, just, just anything in the immersive world. Oh. Could be AR, could be XR, could be... Oh, I mean, we're active with a, a number of projects, I think, across the, across the spectrum in terms of immersive, but I think in terms of HMD stuff, yeah, sort of what I was referring, I can't name the brand, but it's a big automotive brand, but they're looking, they came to us actually looking to use Quest Pros uh, for sort of previs and sort of dealership sort of onboarding. Uh, and now with the Vision Pro announcement, they, they're already wanting to swap. And that's what several thousand dealerships, you know, potentially rolling out with the Vision Pro. That's it. So you just might be able to go to a dealership and... Completely pre -vis your car, yeah. all the trim levels, yeah. even test drive it, you know, sort of virtual, all good in test drive. Yeah. Thing, so. and, they, and they're looking at that for headsets as opposed to sort of magic room? They want to do headsets for whatever, you can step out in the, in the parking lot and car and suddenly it, appears, yeah. walk yeah. around the... Yeah, I think cool. that, that's the interesting thing now is it's just there's so many interesting sort of how do you visualize something, Yeah. right? Like a, the headsets are one aspect, you know, are you doing AR, or VR, but also the your magic sphere thing that we're going to go look at is, you know, putting somebody in a room, the virtual production technology, leveraging that, but it's sort of the holodeck moment, right? Yeah. Like the, what can I throw on all of these walls? Can I react to it? Can I feel like I'm in a different environment? And I think that's that's interesting that it's we're we're pushing really hard on all the visualization techniques, the the amount of screen uh, screen tech now that's coming out that's 3D visualization without glasses, yeah. um, that you know you you've got laptops you've got bigger screens that full 3D immersive 3D that's good and no glasses. Sort of riffing on that, and I don't know if this qualifies, but I think it's technically immersive. Um, you said Sphere, and that's where it triggers something. So we're working with MSG Sphere, which is mm -hmm. the big yeah. dome in Vegas. Big, big is an understatement. Yeah. yeah, largest screen in the world, highest resolution screen, I think, in the world, yep. in terms of like public display. 16K. 16K, they shoot 8K natively to you know, capture, uh, and we're in post-production on a number of big projects. For did you see Shulkin just released his camera? I did, jerk. 18K <laughs> sensor. Yeah. What camera is that? It's they custom Bespoke, built custom built. a camera. Cosm did, or? Um, Andrew Shulkin, Shulkin is the lead on it, but yeah. uh, MSG Sphere. Yeah, it's like 18K. No, 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 the MSG Sphere is the MSG Central Madison Square Garden, and that is a venue that is just being finished in Las Vegas. You can see it from space. It's uh, how many <laughs> meters in diameter? It's, you know, meters in diameter. 30,000. Inside it seats, was it 17,000? It's, it's, it's up to 30, yeah. It's a yeah. basketball stadium. Yeah. yeah. Of a, of a major arena, and the entire interior of the sphere is a screen. And exterior. Now, was it the exterior screen or is it the yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's oh, most of what, most of our work is for the exterior. Yeah. Oh, it's for the exterior. And okay. the yeah. interior is not a full dome experience, uh, but the way it's designed and the seats is you effectively have the screen wrapped in such a way that unless you like turn completely around and look this way, but it is a yeah, It's like a three quarter. Screen. Yeah, it's a three quarter. Interior. So that, that's an interesting uh, aside discussion. Is that a new, I, I, I've been advocating that's sort of an immersive medium unto itself, ultra large. I think so, I yeah. think so. And it's like right now it's the only one. Well, their sound technology yeah. is oh, cutting out. Oh, the sound's yeah. So you better. could be like, like have you have oh yeah. Video? I haven't, I'm doing the I've, demo next week, but uh -huh. um, it's like you're over on the, that far end and they've localized language. Yeah. So you could be hearing Japanese, and I'm hearing next week English. Yeah, next week. You could be Japanese, listening to Japanese. The guy next to you is French. It's yeah. That to me, this when I heard about the sound technology, I was it's, like, it's that's a projected impressive. the beam it's, forming. It's yeah, it's, it's and there are a, a massive amount of drivers as opposed to just big drivers. Yeah. And the idea is that the sound is if you can think of listening to a cha chamber orchestra at rock. You know, the fidelity mm -hmm. of a chamber orchestra at rock volume. So the audio from me to her is the same as from me to him. And so you get no matter that where same, you are, it's the same yeah. level. 
and it's directional. So this section may be listening to one language, that section a different language, that section a different language. Um, the seats are 4D, so mm -hmm. they're rumble seats, yeah. um, yeah. things like With that. sound. Yeah, so it's a, it's a programmable experience that is daunting in all the aspects of it. Yeah. The uh, beamforming spatial audio, by the way, was developed at a lab at Atkinson Hall. I forget what's the name of it. Yeah, Peter Otto is yeah. the is the is the, is the, is the, the uh, professor that originated that technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, all of this is super fascinating because you know I mentioned earlier the idea of like isolation and how do you create social experiences. So to be able to have community, but have a tailored experience in that same. Ex yeah. it, so unlike the movie theater where it's all darkened and everyone has kind of the same. Thing, but everyone, someone's sitting in the back. I, there's a large hat in front of me. I have to look around it. I'm on the exit aisle, and everything's distorted. The idea is to create um, a optimal experience for every individual, but yet I'm still hanging out with Joe, yeah. and we're still there together. So it's a that's a good blend, and that's I think really good immersive design because it's taking into account you need humanity, and then yet you want technology to make the experience like something worth the money that you're going to yeah. get, yeah. which is going to be a pricey ticket. It's going to be pricey. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, well, I know sports is a major use case where you can go to the Super Bowl or you know a giant event as if you're there in the MSG Dome. But this also begs the question of production technology. Maybe you, you can talk a little bit about it. So you talk a little bit about But when you're producing for these mediums, it's a different ballgame, right? So obviously Lucasfilm has, has done a lot of you know games and virtual production and you know, what's under the hood, and what can we expect, and what should students what can you talk about? be studying to, yeah. to, to well for this? And do we have to kill everybody? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> no, no, they, they, they briefed me on this. But um, <laughs> so my role is a little different, where these guys are sort of overseeing the production of content and the shaping of technologies for use cases. And really, what I do and I've done since I graduated from UCSD, way to go, Tritons, is basically um, by combining and, for lack of a better word, distorting and perverting technology that they would use for this sports arena to find a way to work with Alejandro Inaratu when he did Blood and Sand, which is an AR VR experience at, at uh, MoCA. Mm -hmm. So for us, it was really exciting that these guys and this university put these insane development bills for all this amazing technology. But the part where it becomes exciting to the production people is where artists, creators, inventors, innovators like you guys, which is honestly why I'm here, is to see you folks see something and then use it in a different way. And I mean, this goes all the way back to think of cave people. And there was one guy who like put his hand up and went, and blew the outline of his hand on the cave wall. And then someone came around and was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And suddenly you have 70 handprints, which are fine. And then a talented creative came along and was like, hmm. And they took a stick and they painted an antelope. And then they painted a bison. And all the hand people went, I never thought of that. Holy cow. They were making turkeys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so maybe it became quasi-religious or a magical or a transformative experience for them. But for people like me who are sort of uh, technocrats, the excitement is the things that we're talking about, who knows what happens inside of your minds, and the seeds that are planted by, because honestly, like how many of us are going to go to Vegas to see this giant stadium? And what happens inside of it? <laughs> like rock concerts? Rock concerts, yeah. Cirque du Soleil. I yeah. mean, it's going to be yeah, kind of everything. It's, it's going to be maybe some of us will go and see the experience. But to experience the tools, to have the transformative moment of looking at the same way I, I'm assuming when you look at paintings or you hear music and it changes you in some way. It's transformative like a virus. The way that you guys then take that experience and manipulate that tool to then create something that we never would have yeah. thought of. The moment when Previz started way back in the day, sitting with David Fincher and him beating us mercilessly, like we were on a Roman slave ship to get the scene in Fight Club where the plane rips open and the seats come out to be perfect. 
his devotion to using existing technologies in new and completely unforeseen and extremely uncomfortable ways for us <laughs> was fantastic. Mm -hmm. The things that he made, the subtleties that he put into it. We may n we'll never notice how many times the chair shakes. Next time you see it, you'll think about it. Yeah. Before the people get sucked out of the plane in Fight Club. But for David, it was transformative to have the ability to do that. And then to see previs grow to now the point where we're working in this giant virtual set with people all over the world, with art directors <coughs> and the director of photography and with everyone doing nothing but wearing highly modified um, Oculus headsets. We all sit there in this, in this magical non-event. Non there's nothing. There's just pixels. It's magic. And have this person go, make that doorway a foot taller. Push that wall back two feet. Mm, it should be 5 o'clock in the afternoon. No, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. A little cloudy. And then to be standing there with you and McGregor and look at it and go, mountains are too tall. Shrink the mountains. Too much. There you go. That was impossible before. People would travel to Tunisia and build this entire thing, and then you'd be like, well, that's it. But so the technology of using, cause so when I was at UCSD, uh, hope this won't cause a problem, we used to sneak in to the Navy's visualization centers and put on these like 16 pound SGI goggles, if you remember those things. And we all were connected with a cable to synchronize them, because otherwise your two eyes would go out of sync. And it was designed so that people could engineer uh, aircraft carriers and battleships and see where ducting was going to go. That's fine. But we used it to make art and to be crawling around in these virtual environments. But we had to do it between 10 PM and 6 AM. Mm -hmm. And it was only because one of us was related to the guy who might have used to run the supercomputer center that we were able to get away with doing this stuff. <laughs> But that was the nascent beginning of all of these different tools being used in unforeseen ways. Yeah. So, you know, I, I kind of sat quietly with the, with the Apple thing because what's going to happen to me and my, my kin is that one of you or a person like you or, or Fincher or Terrence Malick or one of these high-end creatives is going to come in and go, I put these on and they were cool and I had an idea. Yeah. And I think it's impossible. And then we do what we call technological improvisation, where the rule in improv, does anybody know what the rule in improv is? Yes, yes and. Yes, and. So when they come to us and say, I want to do this totally ridiculous, impossible thing, we go, yeah, and that would be awesome. And then <laughs> we, open, we inadvertently open this door. And so it's a really beautiful sort of coexistence of you guys do this incredible visualization and creation. And then as an even better effect, you create you, the people who will drive new technologies. Architects who, by using this stuff, will create spaces in ways that had been, like maybe they'll create physical impossible designs, but are beautiful. You know, There'll be artists who will create whole worlds that are impossible, but are now doable. And then it sort of feeds back and forth between giant creation of <coughs> creators, innovators, artists, dreamers, who then create a dream space that then, thank God, the five of us get to live and play inside of. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, for me, the headset is just, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. Like Working with Apple is, I don't anymore. <laughs> Working with Apple is super difficult because they're really super secretive about things. So mm -hmm. you just get stuff and you go, what is this? Yeah. And they're like, well, it's for the thing. And I'm like, yeah, we still don't know what the thing is. Oh, the thing is the iPad. Oh, good to know. OK, great. But you don't find out until you build the UI mm -hmm. or the UX. And yeah. then you have to go through rounds and rounds with Steve Jobs, which is, I miss Steve. But it's terrible because he's brilliantly and ruthlessly interested in where he's going. And it's the same experience with high-end people. It's their, it's their integrity and their lack of compromise that drives forward technology in ways that are unpredictable but incredibly fertile. So that's what I'm excited about, is the stuff that is, you're going to think of it. And for whatever reason, you're going to have a budget, or somebody will pick you up as a passion project and go, let's do this thing. And you'll do something that will 
completely revolutionized things so that, like with Magic Leap, where you see the whale, that, I don't know how many of you have seen this thing with a high school student, it was so awesome and promising, and then the real product was like, yeah, <laughs> Bleh. Because it lacked that moment of the gear meshing with someone who was creative to bring forth some completely unforeseen thing. So, yeah, that's what's really exciting for me is the terrifying, unknown, unanticipatable, <clears throat> unquantifiable excitement of the new. Yeah. So one of the things that is touted as new-ish is what Meta calls the metaverse. <clears throat> and what Apple didn't mention, <laughs> and is this idea of a world where people can be in that's a virtual landscape of some sort. So the question is, what is that? And where is it going? And is there, there's now a dozen of these kinds of things, right? There's VR chat, there's Horizon World, there's the sandbox, there's uh, Synovium place, there's, you know, different companies that have their own version of this. Some of them are so-called open. Some of them are just proprietary. Do you have any comments or, you know, ideas of how that is going to pan out? Is there one that we should be paying more attention to than others? How should innovators, artists, technologists approach these worlds, uh, world building in the world. Mm -hmm. For production, they're great. I mean, you mentioned previs and so forth. You can create entire movies almost, you know, virtually. But what about these worlds? Who's what going first on this one? Who, who wants <laughs> to go <laughs> first? <laughs> Rochambeau? Uh, no way. You go. So the... Yeah. Let Joe go first. Yeah, of course. Yeah. The thing, once again, is that yeah. To, to be blunt, the trick to creation is failure. Mm -hmm. Thomas Edison, I think he made 100,000 different versions of the filament of the light bulb. 100,000. There were teams of people who traveled the globe bringing back the dodo feather <laughs> so that some guy in, in Menlo Park or wherever it was could light it up and go, nope. So, you know, and so there are all these different iterations of these worlds, and through users and interactions and feedback, there'll be some sort of evolution, but the evolutionary process isn't linear at all. It's surprising and shocking. So, you know. Well, and I, and I think to that end, there's a, we're early on that, mm -hmm. and there's two sides to it, which is, there's like the, there's the Apple side of it um, when they create products, which is no one needs this, so we have to invent a reason for people to use it. Yeah. We have to motivate them. And then there's the, it's a tool, so we're solving a problem. And I don't think that it's at a center point yet. It hasn't mm -hmm. met at the center. And I think it needs to because, once again, I, I use my mom in a lot of my little stuff, <laughs> which is like, does she care? And she called and she's she, not happy yeah, about exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. She's like, I'm uh, getting no messages from her as I sit here. Um, she, unless, unless her or any of my relatives or even, you know, my wife, they, they understand and there's a purpose for it that is going to improve our personal lives, I don't think we have the opportunity to get scale with it. And so I think I don't even, working with a company that, Actually got rid. I can go ahead and say this. They no, got yeah. rid of their metaverse. <laughs> Did you like, like the metaverse? What? Says we yeah. we fired them. Right. Exactly. Clearly, they didn't have a purpose. Mm -hmm. There was no. It wasn't built into their DNA yet. There was no. I mean, they it, it was dis, it was disposable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not there yet. I don't think the purpose of metaverse, other than for companies that want to make money by aggregating people in a virtual space, I don't think for the consumer it's there yet. Unless you're playing a game. Yeah. If you're playing Fortnite. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, a few things. Um, one. By the way, the rest of you are free to raise your hands as well. <laughs> are all of you actually you know texting you your questions to him? <laughs> That's not fair. No, no, seriously, yes. Okay. Alex, go ahead. So, um, um, so, one thing you said about the caveman art and yep. how they mm. started out using that 
Well, um, I was wondering if you were thinking they were, what would you think your mindset was? You think, oh, I can make this, or like, I want to write the story for my future. Were they thinking like that, or were they thinking like, you know, some other way? Stop feeling me. Um, <laughs> and like, I feel like with Apple's new everything, I am not. I'm starting to not like Apple due to the fact that they just keep adding like these tiny little effects to each phone. I'm like, stay with the iPhone 14 until you actually figure out something that's legitimately better than the last iPhone. Because hmm. I, I like, what's the difference between 12 and the 14? What, what can you get better? A camera and a little bit more battery. So what do you think, why do you think they're doing that? Why do you think they're releasing a new one every year? <laughs> sure, Bryce. A, a yeah. I like you. Yeah. <laughs> um. B, share price. Well, B, yeah. and share price. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. you know, it's it's yeah. There's there's a lot packed in there. <laughs> it's funny because the the caveman. Yeah. I, I love that because I use that in actually a conversation around the the M word. Um, yeah. And you know, you think about the the yearning to tell stories and the canvas to which we told stories on, right? And I use the start with cave paintings, right? Like we needed a a, a canvas and a way to start doing something with that canvas cave paintings. And we see this constant evolution of, I, I want to have an environment to tell a story in. You know, you think of a stage play, right? And you think of people on that stage that put on a costume and become somebody different. And they may even become a different person or a gender or, you know, a, and they may even become a creature. And then we've started introducing digital tools to start doing the same kinds of things, but in a broader context and maybe be able to do it across space and time yeah, I look at gaming I look at gaming I look at you know the the Habo Hotel and uh, MUDs and I look at you know Second Life and you know I go to World of Warcraft and you know Second Life is worlds and I can build my own worlds and then I look at all the storytelling that goes on in a World of Warcraft where they they're con constantly writing stories and inviting you to participate in that play and then Roblox Yep. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then, all, uh, you know, the the next generation of Fortnite engine. I always UFDN. I always get that wrong. Um, it, do you like for <laughs> pause? Enough of pause. that. Yeah. yeah. Enough for, of you. You said, you said in video games that um, you said that like they can. They're kind of changing the way you think about things. Do you like have any? expectations for how they will be in the future or if radio player one will become a real ready player real player ready player one will become like a real reality well it's, i mean i think that's the, the fascinating thing right is is it's interesting where if you take world of warcraft it was a group of people writing stories that you come and participate in and and it has a structured universe you can play in that universe but it's a structured universe you can't go outside the boundaries Roblox, the next generation of the, the Fortnite creation engine, are putting you in the role of the storyteller and the creator of the world mm -hmm. and opening that up. And what's interesting is, is Roblox, they, it all had sort of a generally uniform look to it. Oh, that's a Roblox universe. It could be a space one or a cowboy one, but it was a Roblox look. The Fortnite creator gets more interesting because you can start really now starting to change the shape and look of those universes. It's interesting because it's the making you all storytellers and go create your universe and your world and your story and your game and tell a story. Um, and here's a marketplace that I have a bunch of objects that you can go use and go. And then here's a monetary system built on top of that. So it's interesting. And is it the only one? No, but it's it's starting to have some interesting elements to that next generation of how are we going to do this? But the interesting thing is you're Ready Player One. It was the melange of different universes and different systems that, that could all coexist. And what do we have that today? Mm -hmm. so, it, so is there any open metaverse standard? No. 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 Microsoft? There's the, there's the, there's the, so there's the open metaverse 
foundation. Mm -hmm. But they're not a standards but body. But they're not a standards body. So, but, so yeah, but, so there really gets, isn't one now. But yeah. I would argue, like, oh. would a metaverse standard, like, uh, Yeah, and I, I, I actually think we're still prehistoric days with the metaverse. I mean, yeah. metaverse as a even pop phenomenon, no, no, not, you know, giving Neil Stevenson his proper due, it became really a pop phenomenon with Zuckerberg two years ago going, we're now the metaverse or meta, right? And that's where that arm race, arms race started. But I would sort of riff off of something John says. I think the metaverse last two years, and as a company that builds big blocks of it for brands right now, um, it's basically gaming rebranded. Yeah. You know, Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite, mm -hmm. These are gaming platforms. Yeah. Roblox launched in 2004, I think, as a web game. Um, and I'm sure the CFO woke up a year ago and said, what, we're a metaverse? And, <laughs> and like, uh, yeah. we're making a killing as well, a metaverse. Well, that, that is interesting. I just wanted to say that yeah. the notion of rebranding yeah. is what you see happening over and over and over again. Yeah. yeah. The, the first metaverse was a book. Yeah. Because you're, it's in your yeah. head. Yeah. And you're living it as you're reading the pages. Yeah. Or as you're hearing a story told around a fire, and so you're imagining it. Yeah. because it's being told. So I think it is, it's just a place where you're not physically at, but you are participating in. I so think it's a exactly merger. I think, I think why I say it's pre-existing, pre I think AR, VR, I think that full continuum is the metaverse. Right. Yeah. It'll be the digital overlaid in your physical, and the physical, the that, digital. That I agree. Like I, it, I, think it, I think that's the ultimate is like, yeah. There's the access there's method, no, yeah. right? It's just and then there's the it's thing. just blended, yeah. Right? Yeah. It is how are we entering into that environment? How are we interacting in that environment? And we do have, you know, the, I, I don't you know, the the open metaverse forum is a lot of companies and folks that are basically there to try to make sure we don't fuck it up. Right. Because yeah. there are people that are in other forums groups and other parts of the industry, and they're like, oh shit, if we let this thing get out of control. They're going to go off the deep end. Yeah. So a lot of those people participating, what they're doing is they're working on the same thing we're doing across other parts of the industry is, what is the infrastructure? What is the 3D object interoperability yeah. mm -hmm. standard? Is it right? decent, it's the, the decentralized versus centralized question. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, and then you ask, who, depending on who you ask, yeah. you might get different. Privacy and security and identity, yeah. right? Like of some yeah. of the fundamental building blocks and you ask if we have something, and absolutely. Has anybody been on the internet recently? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it is iterations and variations on that theme. Yeah. Like, it's a, it's, we're continuing to build on that. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the notion of 3D worlds, you know, what is it, Bermel? <laughs> God, yeah. love, right. God, yeah. God love Tony. Yeah. Um, and Mark. Mark, uh, You know, 3D objects in a web environment. And it, was virtual reality markup language for the kids at home. Um, and it didn't get very far simply because the computational power on your local device was not keeping up and it was harder to do. And you we were trying to squeeze a lot of things through a very limited bandwidth. We evolve that constantly. But it is that web work of infrastructure and you know the ability to move bits between point A and point B. It is, if you look at the foundations of what the web was, it was a bunch of researchers saying, we need a way that I can share my research paper with another university institution and they don't have to log into our servers because that's a security problem, but I need to be able to publish a paper. So, what, so, so let's talk about how this impacts entertainment industry writ large, movies and TV shows. How, do you, how are you feeling about this? How are you feeling about the future of <laughs> movies and TV and streaming? You have an opinion? Uh, you, no. <laughs> you have an opinion about this? Go for it. it. If you define the entertainment industry as movies and TV, you're living in the past. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's yeah. interesting. Right. Okay. Wait, there's, you there's, could there's, say linear narrative, uh -huh. or you can say multi-platform, which is technically everything everything else. And, and it could include linear, because it's whichever platform you choose to. So are you feeling the balance starting to tick time? No, there's no, there's no balance. There's no balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that there isn't, you know, I, I mean, this has been an ongoing conversation with like te film television versus like games. I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. Games makes way more money, right? It's, it is a, actual like good 
ROI, you know, let's the, all the MBAs come out and yes, but there's not really like, here's, here's my example of it. And if you haven't watched the show, then you should go watch the show. It's Yellowstone. I binged it. Mm -hmm. And it's basically Kevin Costner doesn't want to give it up and will die on the Alamo. That's all I'll say. <laughs> oh, okay. That's a very... Wow. Industry. <laughs> There's a lot uh, packed yeah, in there. I know, I know. If you watch the show, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Wait, oh, wait, wait, we have, a, we have another one. New, new, new hand. Um, I don't know if I'm going too broad here, but I have, I have great ethical concerns yes. about all of this. Um, all of it? Well, just just virtual reality in general. I mean, we have a society that's we have huge numbers of like depression like going up and narcissism going up just from social media expanding. Mm -hmm. When you take the human brain and you put it in a virtual reality environment that it can really believe it's in yeah. another mm -hmm. world, yeah. you have much more like power over affecting and potentially destroying human beings and their minds. And if money is the guiding force behind that, and as you were all saying, technology has been being completely driven by money, uh, basically across the board here, I'm very concerned with the psychological health of our society. Mm -hmm. And you know, I have a friend who does games, who created a game so that brain surgeons could practice their surgery over and over again before they're actually in surgery so that they wouldn't kill anybody. You know, yeah. so they succeed every time. That's a really good moral use of that type of technology. There's there's deep psychological healing that could come with this type of technology. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, but if there's nobody, if there's no moral conscience driving the ship, it could just destroy society. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, you, what do you, yeah, you, you start. Yeah, you go for it. Uh, yeah. Moral ethical I, implications. I, I, I get asked to speak on this uh, fairly regularly, and I've, I've done this lecture before. Um, I do think there's a good mat. I, I think any tool, there's good mat, right? Uh, I think most of us are obviously looking for the benefits and the great, great use cases. I do think a lot of hospitals are using virtual and immersive mm -hmm. technologies for therapy and uh, all these goods. But I will give you kind of a, a, bad, a sad story of it, I think, as well, or a potential sad story. I think um, South, uh, South Korea um, was struggling with video game addiction it was, uh, and was became the first country to come out with its, you know, its government actually sort of mandating usage, particularly around cyber cafes and whatever, because they were seeing you know, drops in their GDP and birth rates and everything. And so video game addiction would, became a real societal concern. It is throughout a lot of Asia and I would say even North America, uh, South Korea became the first country to really start like trying to like uh, regulate and, and figure it out. Uh, and it helped. It, it's actually, they've seen it as a rebound. Um, but the, the flag there is that was on PC and mouse video right. games. You put that society or any society in a headset, to your point, that society just goes, you know, goes dark, <laughs> like basically. So it is something we need to be very vigilant about yeah. in terms of like, you know, training and actually putting the safety. You can put safety precautions in the headset. It just shuts off after 30 minutes of use, right? And if we start kind of figuring out these things, I think we can get ahead of it. I think, yeah, wow. There's a lot to pack in here. Um, I, I'm actually one of the. You said what projects were you excited of, right? So I I spend part of my time uh, helping a nonprofit, and we're focused on social emotional learning, leveraging headsets, um, and working with kids, at, uh, youth at risk, uh, and a lot of work with. Uh, if you guys know Skip Rizzo and um, Brain yeah, Mind, yep, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, working through that to develop a curricula to help kids through some challenging times. Um, and I've looked in, in various other, and you're, you can do amazing things with this. And I feel like it's one of those things where it's like a hammer. I can bludgeon somebody to death or I can build a house. What do I do with it? Um, and I, uh, being a technologist for many, many years and being on sort of the forefront of like, we can build a lot of things, but what do we do with it? It's, it's you raising that alarm is exactly what people need to talk about, yeah. right? right? Like it's the, we're going to do these things that, you know, the technology's out of the bag, you can't put it back in, but how do we think about it and, and what do we, a, as a group, you know, move forward? I mean, a, a lot of the challenges we see with some of the technology, the isolation is, is not because the technology is inherently evil and sucking them in, is we have society problems. Yeah. We have an issue where people who are 
you know, in the gaming, why are they doing that? And we too often say and vilify an in technology and say that's inherently bad because it's doing this to the people and they're like, why are they going to that direction to begin with? Yeah. So I think we, we also need to address that. I, look, I, I, previous business before I am now is, is that I was in the business of making digital humans. That was my next question. And I'm here to tell you, we can do some scary <laughs> right? Yeah. I can make a digital human that will fake you. And it's, it's amazing, you know, and what we can do with AI to replicate somebody's voice and to be able to replicate somebody's look. And the fact is, is that every time you go into a public place, it has that nice little plaque that says, by entering in here, you waive your rights for digital, like, you should be nervous about that. And I say this because I want people to think about it. It's when I worked with actors and I said, what does your contract say with regards to your digital identity? Yeah. Right? Because it's no longer are you just talking about your likeness, it's your digital identity. But if you negotiate well, you could use that, right? You can put your digital identity to work. You can be somebody that you're not. You know, the, the, the amazing part of this technology is, is that I can now enable somebody to be somebody else. That an industry, I have to be careful, an industry that certain body types and certain tropes would get more jobs and be able to, if I can be a completely different person, and if I'm a good actor, and I can make you believe that I'm a completely different person or a completely different gender or completely different race, wow, the liberation of that. An industry that benefited on beauty and certain ages and certain genders, if I can change that, I think that's very powerful. But it's also very scary. Right? Like, that's why I said security, identity. Mm -hmm. These are some of the common things that we have to focus on from an infrastructure standpoint. Because it's important that I go online, I may want to be somebody else. But how, what is the verification? How do you know it's me? Do you need to know it's me? How do we have that exchange, right? These are all those kind of fundamental things that you asking the right question is absolutely. And more people need to ask it. And then we need to work on how to address that. So Eric, that might be a good segue Sorry. into the intersection I'm going to get off my AI now. with these technologies, because that's part of what you are. Do you mind if I jump in real quick? Sure. Okay. Thank Jennifer. You. Um, all right, so I, I love this question. And I think it's more important than to say, oh, we need to be thinking about this. I think we need to really consider governance and or policy and or cultural changes associated with the thought process of development. Mm -hmm. so, so we're thinking about ESG, right, a very hot topic, also sensitive and, sensitive and easily politicized topic, environmental social governance. To me, mm -hmm. the social part, social responsibility, is where this lies. Yeah. And I think an easy way to look at it is um, actually a quote from the seventh generation product line with every choice, consider its impact on the next seven generations. Yeah. So therefore, if we, if we feed our choices through that, that helps us with the ethical implication of the decisions we make. And I also want to mention, um, I think being in America, a capitalistic society, I think it's important to say or demonstrate we can reach for max profits while also reaching for max positive impact. The two don't have to be divorced. So again, it's a cultural shift in my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, okay, so I'm difficult. I'm a very difficult person, but the worlds that I'm working in are the empowerment and enablement of creatives and creators to make art. So in a sense, the evanescence that drives these people to do these things is, is maybe one step off from what you're talking about, which is totally key. And the looking down the road is super important to, we can make, no offense, Power Rangers 16 the <laughs> most popular movie on the planet by what? getting, sorry, a little bit of engineering 
to make it where it's irresistible to people and they'll have to buy the toy and they'll have to subscribe. So from a corporate perspective, it's incredibly important that they wake up and bear responsibility, getting to you, bear responsibility <laughs> for the long-term impact. But in, the, in entertainment, one of the huge challenges to that is that when, you, when a movie's made, a corporate entity goes and is, exists for a moment and makes that film, and at the end of the film, they close it, and it's yeah. gone forever for mostly the reason that if something bad happens, then it's just that one entity and they're already gone. So you can't sue them, they're gone. Mm -hmm. It's this strange mindset. And the, that treatment of that legal entity passes down to every crew member, where the crew members, well, the crew members are treated kind of like um, the Jodes and the Grapes of Wrath, <laughs> where you hire them and they work really hard for you and they're in a union and the union protects them to some extent and makes you be good. But in production, people are still working 16 hours a day. Even after the deaths of multiple, multiple employees, it's, it's, we're still working people like that. I don't work my team like that. I, I couldn't live like that. I used to work 100 hours a week. We used to math out render times in terms of, we have 96 hours to render this, but we only have to finish it in five days, and that's 120 hours. So if we just work this whole time and sleep for like four hours, we can get it done, which is completely amoral and it's inhumane. And I'm so sorry that I did that, but I left that job and I've now got a whole new career where on one hand, it's really easy for me to sleep at night because when a creative goes, hey, I wanna do this thing, you know, it's like Vincent, where Vincent Van Gogh goes, oh, oh, goes, I'm going to cut off my ear. And you're like, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't think that's the best idea, but OK. So for art, for art's sake, <laughs> we don't see things from a moral perspective. But you are correct, in, and sorry to speak for you guys, but for entertainment and media, there's really this long-term historical treatment of people and projects and content and ownership in sort of a feudal system. Mm -hmm. and. It's really hard to escape from, and that's actually one of the benefits of working at Lucasfilm, is they brought me in to create a continuity across multiple years so that we can break that chain. So there's the beginnings of awareness, but I'll tell you that, you know, I can't speak for you guys, but I after... You just were. You are? Yeah, yeah, I am. But after 30 years, a lot of people are so uninterested in tomorrow. And it's super important that you ask these questions yeah. because that then sparks the thought and then you have the more then developed fire version of that spark. Yeah. Mm. So to, to take that into a practical application of like, well, where, where's the friction point mm. for that? Where do you actually start to apply that thinking of having people be thoughtful about planning? for the future, you have to look at the market system. And so for big media companies, the plan, I was talking about this earlier, like yeah. the annual operating plan, five-year plan, those all are fine. Maybe the annual, maybe an, a year-long plan is, is, is okay. Five-year is ridiculous yeah. um, based on how things are changing. But regardless, we're on a quarter system because we report quarterly earnings to Wall Street. So if you want to start changing things, you have to, you have to look at Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Because the way that we report out between, you know, especially here in the United States, between Christmas and then you've got spring and you've got Mother's Day and then you've got back to school and you've got these rhythms. But regardless, you, what you all everything, everything is controlled by your earnings and quarterly readout. And so to say plan for seven generations, <laughs> that is that you have to send that message to the right person and the right people in organizations. And I would argue that people that are creating entertainment is a great place to start because they are the storytellers and that is an external element. Like even the creators to Disney. Yeah. They hire, like I worked in the company for a long time, but I very rarely actually produced anything. 
every, every creator is really hired shotgun. They're freelance. So you start way outside, and then you bring big ideas in, and then those ideas can get created and they can get projected to the world. You think the writer's strike will have an impact? 100%. Big time. That is going to change a just, lot of things. Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to answer it also sort of in a different way, because I, I agree. I think there's a top-down legislation. We've got to figure, figure that out. Uh, but I also think there's a bit of a bottoms up, and I think yeah. often people within the groups or within the industries know most. And I, and I have to say, VR is still early days, but there's actually a well-known sort of like this problem. And sorry, the gentleman in the blue. It's, it's a well-known challenge that you know, mm -hmm. vi uh, video game addiction or screen addiction is going to be way worse in a VR headset. It's a well-known thing. So within the community, we're grappling with it. Yeah. Um, and then I would actually uh, sort of extract that to um, the games industry. I would actually say the games <laughs> industry is probably one of the most exploitative. Yeah. Um, mobile games are just a, it's just an A-B test on how to maximize dopamine addiction. It literally is. So that's every mobile yeah. game is a dopamine <laughs> addiction machine. Yeah. Um, and they know it, and they exploit it, and that's, they just, they update every game to maximize that dopamine. And it's well documented. It's not even a hidden secret. Um, and so, but already in the games industry, it's early days, you're seeing makers and coders and developers and game designers sort of push back on that urge. Um, and so you're, you're seeing that. Um, again, it's sort of a grassroots. I don't think it's going to be quite as effective as I think some top-down could help, but it's, it's, it's good to see it. There's a silver lining. Combination probably yeah. is a great, yeah. a great way to go yeah. at it in both directions. Yeah. Well, well with that, I want to uh, hold up another question. We, I want to show the video that you brought okay. so we can talk about some of the bridges to be built with the university and the university community. Um, part of the whole purpose of this building is to bring folks like you here and talk about these subjects in a, in a forum like this. So I'm really glad we could do that. So I'm going to show the video that um, you brought, Chris, to advertise the uh, opportunity with the Television Academy, right? Yeah. Um, this stuff? You Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Chris, you're supposed to intro your My piece. intro? Sure. This is, um, so I will say that uh, this was given to me by the Television Academy. Um, their internship program is part of the foundation, which is their nonprofit side of the organization. Um, so just so you know, their internship program is industry-wide, paid year-round. Uh, and um, they, they are paid internships uh, for college students across the United States, and they're hosted by a lot of companies um, that are Los Angeles based, including um, HBO, Disney, Shondaland, DreamWorks, End of All Shine, and Bunny Murray Productions, just to name a few. Um, the, the program, from firsthand experience, is extraordinary. It's a really good one to look at, and it's a great touchstone if you're looking to have um, any sort of relationship with the entertainment industry or work in the entertainment business. Yeah. That's, that's really good. Foundation is really helping to change what the landscape of TV looks like. There's a shift now in the kinds of stories that are being allowed to be told, and the Television Academy Foundation is helping to amplify those voices. This internship program changed my life and made me realize that I can be the next time around different ethnicities, different backgrounds, and it's amazing to just bring something new to that industry. It really set me up for success uh, in my career. I don't remember this ever happening. You know, sitting down and having this kind of conversation about Latinos or the Latinx experience in Hollywood. The things that we're beginning to do on Grey's Anatomy, we say, please submit actors with disability. Why are we only seeing able-bodied people? There's nothing about this patient who says he can't be deaf. We're illustrating this idea that we are indeed everywhere, even on TV. Every piece of information that we get is taken back to the classroom. The session with the women directors was amazing. All the access that we've had to these people has just been eye-opening for me. I've always loved the interviews. To have them chronicled and have their essence on tape and on film for future generations, I think is fantastic. The legacy matters a bit. To sit here and imagine something watching this in 50 years is kind of interesting. This is for all the women in animation that have finally made it. 
this award means so much to us, but not just us, but also the LGBT community. Thank you to the Television Academy Foundation. I just let the Television Academy Foundation reaches back and anoints the next generation. It was a 20-year-old kid, and I'm sitting in rooms with Barry Diller. Who else gives you a chance like that? I absolutely owe my career to the internship program. I wouldn't be here today. Uh, thank you, Academy. It's been a great 21 years. Thank you. So uh, just to wrap that up, so established in 1959, the Television Academy is the public charity for the TV Academy itself, the Emmys, which promotes industry excellence throughout the annual Emmy Awards and provides career enhancement and networking opportunities for more than 25,000 members. So um, if you have any questions about that or you want information on it, I do have a sign-up uh, sheet in the back, and uh, they're happy to be in touch, and hopefully we'll have more programs down here. Um, with the school? Jimmy yeah, I hope to make this a quarterly uh, kind of a mixer with uh, the PGA and Television Academy. Mm -hmm. So we'll have, we'll have more, more panels. Uh, any other questions for the panelists before we wrap up this portion of the evening? Oh. Uh, just, oh, there's someone in the back. Yeah. So, so are you asking about what what are the tools, what are the jobs, the roles? Yes, that would be one area of all, just how these emerging technologies are being utilized by designers. What all mm. would they hope to get from like these emerging technologies? So the the trick is that the world has become, and we were actually talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. the really exciting thing that's happened in the 100 billion years since I was here <laughs> is that it's so much easier to have tools on your phone, you know, accessible. Like I said, we used to have to like sneak into government facilities to do stuff. And now, you know, the company Unreal is really dedicated to helping independent filmmakers learn how to use it and have basic technologies and have accessible stuff so you can shoot virtual sets. Like, you know, uh, and it's, and again, like it's, they're thinking of it in terms of this large corporation taking their engine and reframing it for the content creation for Obi-Wan Kenobi. So that when they're shooting, it's really awesome for us practically because instead of being in Tunisia, Ewan's shooting and he's on the thing and then they rap, and he's in Manhattan Beach. So he walks 20 feet into this big, beautiful dressing room with tile floors and cleans up and goes home. And I was standing on set, and instead of being in Tunisia, which is beautiful, but kind of sucks to be at for like three months, I'm 28 minutes away from my house, and on the way home, I get in and out. But um, the thing is that it's, it's the accessibility of these tools for you guys so that you can create it's way easier to shoot, like Chris's son just shot a ton of stuff outside on green screen. Well, it's way easier to come to the campus and probably get time in one of the rooms here to work out you know, some kind of interactive space with particles and dancers and collapsing architectural things that weren't possible in physical space, coordinated or, you know, I'm just spitballing here, but <laughs> really wild ideas that you have that now instead of having to go and sneak in at night and make do with it because it sucks because you finish at six in the morning and you're really tired for your film 101 lecture the next day. <laughs> and as you guys all know, the professor will see you in the back and they'll pick you out and go, what did you think about ashes and diamonds? And you're like, <laughs> uh. so it's, it's this accessibility, it's the accessibility to tools and then seeing how these guys are using it and going, oh, and then having us talk to you and go do whatever you want to do. Because what I count on is you seeing this amazing stuff that they're creating and that being sort of a spark for then your fire to do your thing. What, what's your focus of study? Yeah. 
reverse engineer, let's figure out what this analyst actually wants so I can better cater my models to be close to this. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, it, here's the other, we're going to use your kit as the example, Chris, because it works so well in all, all right. of this. <laughs> yeah. So the, the interesting thing is, the, you know, we were talking about the democratization of, of technology is a great enabler. It's also a great crippler, you know, but the, the accessibility to distribution. Distribution is no longer a problem. If you want somebody to see the thing you make, that is not a problem. Mm -hmm. And if you whine about it, stop. Now, if you want to get paid, that's a different story. Then comes the tool sets to do amazing things that you only could see in a Hollywood film, but by God, now those tool sets are free and you can go at it. But the one thing that Chris pointed out is somebody fucked <laughs> up the audio, <laughs> right? The, I can give you amazing tools. I can now give you ubiquitous distribution. The thing you have to learn is what to do with all of those things mm -hmm. and the fundamentals that we were talking about. We're like, what, do, what, what is the thing we could tell students today is, for God's sake, pay attention to the fundamentals. Yeah. Because his son, somebody in the tool chain screwed up and they have bad audio and they're trying to fix it in post. Okay, right? Like, no matter the powerful tools that I can shoot amazing, you know, ProRes, you know, high definition on this thing is, there's still things you gotta think about. There's still the, the art of per being a producer, yeah. right? The, I, I gotta put these things together. I, I can't, just because just I throw you an amazing high-end tool doesn't mean that magic is going to happen. Yeah. There's this fundamental of the skill set, even like with design or whatever you use, whatever technology brings you, you still have to have an opinion of it. Mm -hmm. What did well, I create that I like? And John, so I just like that looks good and and know that that's that's where there's a misnomer of like oh all these tools are going to like replace the human factor but the human factor actually has a has an opinion that's the difference versus back data to your original quote the main job of a producer is making choices making choices yeah. <laughs> and it is and john used this notion earlier he said it's about intention and i think there is the art of intention which applies to anything here, which is, look, we're all here for a finite amount of time, and what we all want to do, whether it's making architecture or it's talking to each other, is we tell the stories of our lives. And so how we choose to do that is really, really important, because it's either going to make people better or it's going to make people worse. So I think ultimately you have to make the decisions about how you want to tell the story of your life. Mm -hmm. That is a good notion to end the panel on. But you can all hang out, uh, some more snacks, mingle. Uh, Professor Smith, may, can you stand up? <laughs> um, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, Professor Smith is the director of the visualization lab. I guess labs, we have yeah. more than one, but um, why don't you tell us a little bit about where you're going to lead us and who wants to go <laughs> with him and see the cave and so forth? Yeah. Sure. So uh, uh, just down the street, there's a building called Atkinson Hall. We also call it the Palm Institute. And for many years now, more than 20, 30 years, it's been kind of one of the leading places for creating immersive environments. And of course, we were some of the first to introduce cave systems. And so we have um, our latest addition that we call the Sun Cave, as well as a lot of other different VR, AR, XR experiences that we have set up in the, in the facility. So you're all welcome to come join me and Stuart, and we'll be taking everybody there to check out the Sun Cave and see the type of work that we do here at UCSD in um, creating these immersive type environments. Cool. And with that, I want to, I want to let you guys go. I want to thank the panel. You can ask them. Atticus. We really appreciate you all coming to visit us, and we hope to have you back again soon. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Hi, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, this was the first time we've ever had a Producers Guild of America and a Television Academy of Arts and Sciences event in San Diego. And we're going to have more of these on a quarterly basis where we're going to bring in people from the entertainment and media industry right here to the OIC in the Design Innovation Building to talk about the future of media and entertainment and extended reality and immersive. 
For more information on upcoming events, visit innovation.ucsd.edu.